Welcome to the Free the Bear podcast, a podcast devoted to California independence, where two guys talk about how crappy the government is and how dumb politicians can be, and that there might be another way. So sit back, enjoy, and as always, Free the Bear. Grrr. You guys have such creative and positive energy behind your movement. I want to learn from it and steal it for ourselves. Um, I love stealing. That's like the, that's the rule number one for, for any movement is, is steal good ideas. I love it. Oh, Hi, great. Yeah, Forbes great. is here. We can just start everything now that Prince, little Prince Forbes is here. I know, I know. You see, you see, Brandon, this is kind of abuse I have to deal with. You know, we're trying to just start up a podcast and it's just endless here. <laughs> is, is this a little jibe, still shot? You know, well, I don't know what to say anymore. Sounds oh. rough. Yeah. It's a very rough deal. <laughs> so happy to have you here. Again, Cascadia is a very exciting thing. I've been reading about Cascadia for a long time. So, I mean, this is very interesting. Thanks for having uh, uh, the time to actually talk with us. My pleasure. So, Brandon, my first half question for you is, where can people learn more information about Cascadia? Or, And if you want, where can people learn more about you? People can learn more at the Cascadia Department of Bioregion, departmentofbioregion.org. Uh, as well as the Cascadia Wikipedia article, and by giving Cascadia Bioregion, uh, just throw it into a search engine in Google, and you'll probably find several different results and several different rabbit holes that will uh, lead you to at least a few hours of reading. That's really what it's about at the end, to just Google it and find the information yourself. My first question, and I, I, I'll be honest, I know the answer, but more for the audience, um, what is the different, well, what is bioregionalism? Sure. So bioregionalism is a way that we define our geography, geography through our natural boundaries and borders rather than human defined borders. And so for Cascadia, the Cascadia bioregion is the watersheds of the Fraser, the Snake, and the Columbia Rivers that all together kind of help define um, both the place, the culture, the people, and the inhabitants of the Pacific Northwest. And more than that, uh, you know, bioregionalism is a philosophy, and it's really about rooting ourselves into place. So it's a place-based philosophy that helps empower every person to be active and engaged about issues they care about. And really working on, you know, one of our main goals is to shift our organizational frameworks uh, to a bioregional framework from, you know, our current federal system of states and counties and cities and national borders that are really arbitrarily defined by, uh, you know, it doesn't reflect the reality of the place or the people, and oftentimes was defined and named after people who never set foot here or didn't live here. And because of that, it tends to be very much a system based in disenfranchisement. What was it that made you decide it's time for Cascadia to become its own nation? What were some of the tipping points for you? You know, I first stumbled onto the idea in 2004. Uh, when I was in class at Seattle Central Community College, and I was taking a class, and we were looking at, uh, we were reading a book by a Maori author called, uh, named Linda Tuhai Smith, and it was on decolonizing methodologies. And one of those steps was to really step back and strip away all of the reality that kind of currently sat and to envision uh, what a better society would look like, you know, if the arbitrary and colonial border borders and boundaries uh, didn't exist. And at, at that same time, you know, I stumbled on the idea of Cascadia and bioregionalism. And at that point, there wasn't very much there. There was some earlier links to the uh, Cascadia bioregional movement in the 80s. And there was uh, Alexander Beretsik had a website up uh, talking about his flag. And then there was some joke sites and some other stuff. And I, I kind of just looked at it and I took it a little bit too seriously. And I just thought it was a great idea. And so at that point, I, I launched uh, Cascadia Now, the Cascadia Independence Project, uh, with the idea of promoting a, a positive and inclusive vision that just argued that, you know, we live in an amazing place and we think that we can be doing better here. One of the biggest things that happens is that we're too wrapped up in these kind of artificial borders. Is that pretty much like one of the biggest talking points is that we're so caught up in these like, okay, you know, 
we had the borders of like California or Texas or something like that. But that was all just basically drawn on maps uh, that, that had nothing to really do with the people in the area, you know, especially like for a more extreme example, like the Middle East, that was just pretty much, you know, a French and British colonial rulers is going with a ruler and this, you know, so to speak, a ruler is going with a ruler and actually just going through and it's like drawing like squares and like, okay, that's our territory. This is this. And you're trying to move away from that. And I guess that's what you mean by decolonization pretty much. Yeah, totally. And I, I think that, you know, I think one of the big things that bioregionalism allows us is it really lets us have conversations for what are systems that are better able to represent our, our place and the people living here. And I think that something that, that I've watched happen a lot is that people get really wrapped up in uh, working along federal um, borders or working along state lines that don't take into account the entire picture. And so when you are working uh, within systems that are already framed against you, uh, quite often it's a losing battle before you've already begun. And so what bioregionalism in Cascadia allows us to do is it allows us to create our own arguments and our own frameworks and then say, hey, why aren't we doing this? And isn't this a better way that we can be living? And I think that you see this a lot where, you know, the, you know, California, the ecology of California doesn't stop uh, just because you go south or just because you go north into Oregon. And here in Cascadia, I mean, one of the biggest examples that we point to is, uh, you know, nature acts bioregionally. Just because you draw a giant line in the middle of it uh, between British Columbia or and Washington uh, doesn't mean that we're not a part of the same ecosystem. And it doesn't mean that, you know, we need to, that we can't be working together in, in the face of forest fires or flooding or droughts or um, you know, here we're here along the Cascadia subduction zone. And so that's, a, a, you know, potentially a huge earthquake, a huge natural disaster. And when that happens, it will be a regional event. Um, and it won't stop just because we draw a line there. One of the reasons I'm so excited to have you on this episode is it gives me an excuse to talk about the most influential um, nonfiction book in my life, um, The Nine Nations of North America by Joel Garreau which was my introduction to bioregionalism. Oh, that's great. He talks about ecotopia. Um, he talks about basically from, I think I'm literally like right on the border. So I think I'm still in California, but it's like Sonoma County all sure. the way Humboldt and up is actually more aligned with the Pacific Northwest than it is California. So my question for you is how much of California are you guys going to take from us? <laughs> well, I think, you know, the first thing is, is uh, that's important is you guys need to jump up and, and take some credit for bioregionalism because uh, you're right. I think some of the, the foundational work and the seminal work, uh, the nine nations of North America was great. And before that, in 1975, you had Ernest Kallenbach, who is a California-based writer, uh, you know, who really uh, wrote about, wrote the book, Ecotopia. It inspired a lot of people. And at that same point in time, San Francisco came down and, and visited recently. But you have uh, Planet Drum Foundation, Judy Goldhaff and Peter Berg, who, along with several other people, created the idea of bioregionalism. And, you know, it's a very, people like to call it the oldest new idea. You know, we say created, but only really what we mean by that is, is to have it enter into Western kind of concepts, but because it's been around in practice for obviously hundreds of years and thousands of years. But I think so. I think it's important, firstly, to realize that this idea of bioregionalism really is a West Coast idea. And it started in San Francisco and it worked uh, north through the 70s. And then uh, and also Gary Snyder, um, another very famous bioregionalist and poet, very big. And then uh, so in the 70s and 80s, you know, it kind of worked north and then. Uh, 19, you know, 1981, uh, David McClowski uh, really kind of gave, gave definition to the, to the bioregion of Cascadia and, and named it Cascadia. And then 1986, we actually started to have these, these bioregional congresses that, that did, were able to bring delegates and, and so forth. And so it's kind of a, an interesting path, but I think it's important to also recognize that California plays a really large, large part in that. In terms of, of California and how far south Cascadia extends, you know, I think what's fun about bioregionalism and, is that culture stems from place, and ultimately it'll be the people who decide. From a bioregional uh, perspective, it goes all the way down to Cape Mendocino. And also, who knows, maybe there's the state of Jefferson, which could be a, a middle ground or a buffer point. Uh, ultimately, it's, it's the people there living there who, should, who are probably the best able to, to speak for their needs and, 
um, talk about who they identify with culturally. You have, I mean, the movement goes across like state lines, federal lines, national lines. Um, where do you think there's more of a support from? Do you think it's coming from more the Canadian side of things as they stand now? Or do you think, again, it's more of an American movement that has like hints of Canada? Well, which way do you think that, again, if you had to kind of like make a bet, like which side would actually be more willing to kind of engage in like what would be basically one of the grandest political experiments? You know, what's really beautiful about this idea is that Cascadia is basically, if you love the Pacific Northwest, you are a Cascadian, whether you know it or not. And what's beautiful is when we set up a table, when we talk, when we give an event, we have uh, everybody from, you know, people in their 70s and 80s who literally read Ecotopia the first time around to high school students, you know, who come up and, and talk to us about, uh, you know, like, and one of my favorite things is that when we're tabling or talking is that, is the people who come up and, and, and kind of say, you know, um, man, you know, I just heard about Cascadia this year, but I've been Cascadian all my life. And I think that that's beautiful because it really sums up the sentiment. And that is that if you live here and you love it here and you want a better future for, for us and, and everyone, um, then you are a Cascadian. And because of that, it has a really strong appeal. You know, our, our supporter base is, is many thousands of people. And when we map the zip codes um, or the area codes, it creates a bioregion. And that's a really wonderful thing to see. And I think that the support for the idea um, stretches both uh, in British Columbia as well as Washington. And it also stretches really well in rural, er rural parts of Cascadia, just as well as it plays in urban areas of Cascadia. There's a lot of different reasons for that. British Columbia has always had a, you know, a history where um, that has, has really moved west and has been different from other parts of Canada. We're very far removed from other population centers. And because of that, we have a very strong regional affinity. You know, Seattle and, and Vancouver are 180 miles away, and yet we're divided by, a, and we share the same ecosystem. We share the Salish Sea, and yet we are divided by a federal border. And that's, that's also tribal territory. That is First Nation land that has also been. So when you talk about, you know, the Peace Arch and these places, it's a very special place because it literally crosses First Nations, city, state, federal lines, everything in between. And yet we are so similar. And so I think, you know, um, yeah. And actually, I mean, it's really interesting. British Columbia has a stronger affiliation for Washington and Washington for British Columbia than any other part of Canada. And also because British Columbia doesn't have a stigma, uh, you know, of the Civil War and, you know, with movements like Quebec, the idea tends to be very, very strong. And, you know, I'll even point out that more people in British Columbia have an affiliation uh, and feel culturally aligned with California than they do any other province in Canada. You know, I think the other thing people don't realize with both the California independence movement and the Cascadian movement is our founding fathers were supportive of it. I was actually reading, I think the other day, about how a lot of the founding fathers thought west of the Rockies should be its own nation. You know, that the mountains were a great you know, defining, you know, border. And I, I hope people start to realize that, that both of us, you know, both Cascadia and California, the federal government is thousands of miles away from us. It's in different time zones. And just by those things, I feel that we are underrepresented. Well, there's never been, you know, and I think, you know, California aside, there's never been a president from Cascadia. I think that you know, there's always, you know, one of our, our main arguments is that the people living here will always be better able to represent their own interests and needs than thousands of miles away in, in a place where there is no vested interest in representing us. And so I think that that's a really important point. Not only are we underrepresented, but it's, it's also just thousands of miles away with little or no vested interest in, in who we are or our future other than resource extraction and economic, you know, concerns. Yeah, that's a very valid point because it seems like, you know, I, I, people will make the counter argument that, you know, because of the internet, the way we have communications now, it's not as remote as it once was. And I, I suppose that's true, but really, again, they don't, like you said, they don't have an investment because they actually really don't live around here. They don't really know the area. Again, they're not really with the people too much. Um, they, they're not really culturally attuned to what the local culture is like. Uh, how do you plan to, 
or is there a plan, I should say, of like having a more representative system? I mean, it's one thing to see, you know, to kind of break away and have like a Cascadia, but it always sounds like you guys are going with very advanced ideas. I mean, again, like the bioregion as opposed to this a simple nation state. How would you best represent people, like say, you know, tomorrow Cascadia goes independent. How would you best represent uh, the people in the area that doesn't become like, you know, whatever the future capital is still as remote as Washington, D.C. in some ways? Or again, like, but say uh, uh, the capital of uh, Canada. Sure. You know, I think, you know, it's a great question. And ultimately, it's a question best left for the people living here. And I think that's one of our number one arguments is that we don't have all the answers. And that's fine. Because what we want to do is we want to have an honest conversation. And we want to have an honest conversation that includes the First Nations living here. And we want to have a, a conversation with the rural areas as well as, uh, you know, as well as the urban parts. And I think what's great is that when we have that discussion and it's the people living here, we're going to have a lot of really amazing answers. Uh, we have 16 million people living here. We have, uh, you know, one of the, the world's um, top GDP per capita. Um, it's an area larger than Mongolia. It'd be sorry, the 20th largest, you know, country in the world, you know, by size. And so it's just, uh, there's so many different elements um, that, that where we can really be working to, to do better. And I think that, you know, that starts with a, a constituent assembly. And that would probably be one of our first steps that if we were ever, ever to remove ourselves, um, it would be to gather the experts, um, you know, gather the people together. When we look around the world, I think you can describe Cascadia, you know, we talk about bioregionalism, but it's also a pro-democracy movement. And so it is an idea that is invested with principles of human rights and rights for the inhabitants of, of everything that lives here. I think that we need to be having a really critical examination of, of how do we do that and how do we increase the livability in the face of climate change and how do we increase livability in th of economic collapse. And I think that what's great is by having that conversation with everybody living here, we will all be happier for it. One of the first things, you know, people always say, well, it should be east of the Cascades or west of the Cascades. But, you know, the nice thing is, is that whether you live in Seattle or Spokane, we can both agree that maybe we shouldn't have the same government, that we shouldn't be a part of the same state. And that if we break those things apart, culture stems from place. So there's going to be different needs. And that's just fine. And by having that discussion, we can come to systems that are much more democratic and much more humane and that really do, um, that are, are smarter and more transparent, and more dynamic, you know, more than that, that like can fit into, you know, a global marketplace in a, in a way that's ethical and sustainable and responsible. Um, because I think that's what we're really gonna need in the next 20, 30, 40, 50 years as we enter this kind of era of, of peak warming and, and, you know, catastrophe. I think you guys are, you've been around a little longer than the California National Party. And I think one thing that you just hit on there is something we're working on. So I suppose I'll ask for advice. You know, obviously, California is a primarily democratic state, but it's really just in the few dense population areas. How, are, how do you work with rural areas that are, are very much Republican? How do you... I don't want to say convince them, but what is your pitch to them to tell them that they're better off in a Cascadian nation rather than being sure. part of America? You know, what's, what's funny is people assume that um, I think, you know, that Cascadia is left or right. And what's really funny is it's place-based. And so it really aligns well to, it, it actually incorporates a lot of different elements that are traditionally libertarian or, or actually fairly conservative. And so the idea of, of uh, removing ourselves from a vast and bureaucratic federal government that, that plays well no matter where you live. And more than that, that we want to empower the communities and the people and that um, people are going to have different needs and that we want to break down big government and really make it, you know, start from the communities. But the honest answer is, is that, you know, we don't convince people because we're very lucky that, again, if you love, if you love it here and you want a better future, you are Cascadian. And so we have a lot of ranchers and Cascadians and uh, who are very conservative. And what's nice is, is that, you know, like we can agree to disagree. And that's also a very, you know, traditionally conservative concept. And so, and I, I do think that, it, you know, here throughout our, our bio region, we do have kind of a unique brand of this kind of like libertarian progressivism, which is very much a live and let live that if you're not harming another person, you should have the right to, to live however you're going to. 
and that, that those are, are, are freedoms that, that should be guaranteed and that every different community um, should really be able to speak for itself. But that's, and that's always like a, a discussion that we're having that's ongoing. But certainly, you know, the, the biggest and most important thing is, is that is to make it positive and make it about a shared vision and a shared future um, that we're all a part of. And uh, it doesn't matter if you're, you know, east of the Cascades or west of the Cascades, because ultimately we all share the same watershed. So whether we disagree politically in a system that's based on disenfranchisement and these arbitrary lines really doesn't matter when you when you pull that away because we share the same watershed. We share in and regardless of that, there's forest fires. We need to be working together. If there's flooding, we need to be working together. If we're talking about food sovereignty, you know, that's where our food comes from. We need to be working together. And that's a discussion for, for all of us. Washington, Oregon by itself will never be able to have that. West of the Cascades by itself will never be able to have that. And so ultimately, it will take the entire Cascadia bioregion working along a single shared administrative framework um, if we're going to tackle issues um, like environmental degradation, pollution, salmon, dams, or starting to institute policies for, for really curbing um, wildfires and shared fiber sheds and energy independence. You know, that's, uh, that's a conversation for all of us that, and, and one that we're excited and willing to have with every different community living here. What do you think is like, I mean, you know, we're, we're kind of talking like, you know, again, we're like, you know, that uh, copying good ideas from each other, right? Again, like, you know, we have shared movements or again, we have like movements that are trying to achieve certain things. Do you have or has the Cascadia movement like come up with any kind of like a, a game plan about how to try to get the ball rolling here? Because like, for example, like in California, like, you know, there's a lot of talk about like, you know, uh, gain like you know members elected to the assembly, for example, or uh, uh, raising out enough uh, signatures so that we can have a um, a uh, uh, initiative on our uh, future uh, ballot. Uh, do you guys have any kind of like um, kind of like a grand strategy you've been thinking of politically about how to kind of like start it so that again you can move towards a future independence, like for example, like uh, an electoral campaign or anything else of that matter? I think we what. California is doing is, is, is a wonderful, is a wonderful idea and a wonderful strategy. And I think one of the most important things that we've talked about is really defining the shared principles for what Cascadia stands for so that people know exactly what it means when people say it and exactly what those steps are. But, and I, I watched, you know, California, you know, at the, at the unity conference, you know, I thought that was a perfect example because um, ultimately whether we agree or disagree, we need to have space for all of us under this umbrella um, if we're really going to succeed. And if we're too busy fighting amongst ourselves, like, you know, we should be working in, in mutual aid, solidarity and supporting efforts, you know, because we're all going to have different strengths that we bring to the table and we're going to all have different issues and passions and we're going to have different language that addresses out to different communities. And so finding those spaces where we can agree to disagree, but still work together as a family, you know, towards a stronger goal and mission, I think is really important. And I do think that all the answers that you're looking for are in history. And I think, uh, especially in this country and around the world, there are such amazing examples of creative individuals coming together and really changing things where people said they never could before. I personally spent, you know, one of, I think the, the really formative moments of my, of my own personal life was that uh, in 2012, I spent four months with two friends uh, living in Tunisia, and we were there for the one-year anniversary of the Arab Spring, and we were there studying and learning about their constituent assembly that they had there in a country of uh, of several million people that had lived under brutal dictatorship for, for decades, and where no one saw this change coming, the government ended up being brittle. And and when that, that government toppled, um, there was a vacuum, and they came together to to introduce things like gender parity, and, you know, within the first several months, I think there were, you know, by the time of the election, just for, for you know, electing the, the body of people that were going to write the Constitution and discuss it um, that would go to a vote, you know, there were 85 different political parties. After the election, there were 112 political parties. And that's in a country that has, you know, that was, you know, like lived under an authoritarian regime that, that you know, allowed no freedom of expression uh, and anything like that. And so... I think it's inspirational and that you can, you should never, you should never go by what people think is possible or not possible. The best that we can do 
is put ideas forward that we know are good ideas and that we know are better and helping and healthy and the pathway forward. And then you just never know what in history is going to happen and what might happen. And so, you know, trying to be prepared for it is, is definitely an idea. You know, it personally, and, and for the Cascadia movement, I think, you know, things that we are looking at, and, and you know, we're looking at California. We've looked at, um, you know, Yes Scotland uh, and the Scottish National Party, I think was very inspirational for us for a long time. Uh, before that, we also looked at Quebec. And I think the key is, is that what we want to really be careful of is that getting an idea to a vote is, is one potential pathway. But getting a majority of people to vote yes is the ultimate goal. And so how do we connect an idea to people's hearts um, in a way where they really believe and, and value the concept? And so that's really what we've kind of worked with. And it is important to note that Cascadia is not just a political idea. It's not just, you know, an idea based on independence. It is for many people. But more than that, bioregionalism is a social, cultural, economic, and political idea. And so, you know, rather than just waiting, you know, for um, to go to a voting box every four years in a system that's rigged and, you know, takes endless amounts of money and time and that you can come out of it with nothing, we also want to find ways that we can be empowering people on a daily basis. And what we want is to find a way that every person, regardless of ability, background, or whatever, can walk out their front door, get involved about issues they care about, or raise awareness with their own voice connect in, you know, plug in with people in their community, find the people who are already making those changes happen, and then see people supported in making those changes. And so it's kind of a dual system in that way that on the one hand, we're working to remove ourselves from federal systems that are toxic and negative and arbitrary. But on the other hand, we are also trying to build our own systems that make those systems obsolete. So we're not just working within the framework of a national system but that we're actually building something better and that if we're able to, when we remove ourselves, not just fall into the same traps of the same capitalist structures. You know, certainly, you know, here, um, I think San Francisco and California is the same way, but um, within Cascadia, there is such extreme wealth disparity um, between people sleeping on the streets and some of the largest tech companies and billionaires. And so finding and striking that balance um, that can really recognize those issues and actually address them in, in, a, in an equitable way it is one of our, our primary objectives and, and one of the things that we will always continue to work on. Would you kind of say that, if I'm kind of like reading this right, or, or reading what you're saying right, you pretty much that the Cascadian movement is based more on a movement of uh, saying, how do you put this, uh, giving forward more positive ideas. Like, not like so much what you're against, because there's plenty of things we could be against. There's plenty of things that we're already discouraged about or upset about. But the Cascadian movement really wants to focus more on the positives to bring forward this kind of a common vision for a lot of people that everyone has kind of a stake in it somehow in some way. Is that what I'm kind of, if that's a way no, to that, I, I think that that's well said. You know, like, I mean, at, at its own, like, it's not about what we're against. It's about what we're for. And when we, like, make that change and we create our own frameworks, then all of a sudden we've shifted the discussion and we're no longer arguing that something is bad or, or this or that, or we're not arguing against what's an action that someone else is doing, which is reactive, um, you know, so we're always losing the tempo because they're always changing. There's always going to be another pipeline or another, you know, this or that where you spend all your energy and time. And so instead, we're just going to create our own systems, create our own language, and now they have to argue and, and defend why, why that's not a good idea. And I think that, that that shift in perspective and tempo is really important. Another reason why it's important to have you on our program is if either of us gets independence, it is going to cause a chain reaction that will make independence vastly easier for the other group. Uh, I, I find the biggest opposition I get to California independence isn't based on anything other than, oh, it won't happen. Right. If one of us can make it happen and that argument goes away, boy, things are going to change fast. Yes. And I think that's also really important that it's important to reach out. Those people, you know, are always going to be there and they'll be there till they won't. And the way that they won't be there is just by proving them wrong and showing them. And so it's really important to reach out with your 10 or 15% of people who are really 
like committed and, and willing to, to be a part of the idea. And for us, what's, you know, really interesting is that, you know, people assume um, the Cascadia, oh, it's just, you know, a bunch of privileged, uh, you know, whatever people. And what we've found is actually the opposite, that traditionally it's actually marginalized communities that are facing persecution and erasure on a daily basis that are the most willing for radical change because they do not have the privilege of safety that a lot of um, white middle-class people have. And so I think really tapping into that and also saying like, hey, this is a, a safe space and we need to be working for all of our citizens who right now literally don't have, have the rights to have their genders recognized or who have faced, you know, um, you know, literally hundreds of years of slavery or genocide or who are losing their green cards or being put into cages on the border. I mean, there are people facing battles for their very livelihoods right now or that are at risk, you know, who might be killed, um, you know, because they get, they get stopped and, and they are fed up. And I think that that's a really important thing. And so it's important to realize that there's an ideological um, perspective to be had around bioregionalism and this is for human rights. But then there's also a very practical perspective that, you know, I think that, you know, the United States and also some extent to Canada with how they've been treating um, First Nations and Indigenous peoples, our countries are descending into, uh, you know, a way of living and have for a long time and against, you know, different communities um, have, have treated them very badly. And that we need to really work to, as, as a community and, and, and group of people, work to address that and actually create a, a pathway forward that can involve truth and reconciliation for those different things. And so that's also a really, uh, you know, important thing to talk about as well. You mentioned that you spent some time in Tunisia during the, the upheaval, or I guess in the aftermath of the upheaval, and you were witnessing firsthand the constituent assembly. Is that correct? Yeah, absolutely. And when you did that, was there anything that really stood out to you that maybe, you know, doesn't have a historical parallel or maybe something that happened there that, you know, really stuck in your mind that maybe people are not really talking about when it comes to these, you know, these kind of revolutionary situations? Is there something that kind of like, this kind of just stuck in your mind that you're basically like, you know what, uh, I've read about the, these kind of situations in books constantly left and right. I've talked to people left and right, but I don't know if anyone picked up on this particular fact or this particular like something or generality. Uh, from that situation? Sure. Well, you know, I, I've got a lot and I've got a lot of different stories. I mean, it was a really incredible time. But, you know, I think more than that, I, I think that something that's just really important is, is you know, like the entire time, um, you know, we were the only Americans staying there. There was very strong anti-American sentiment, but never did we ever feel in danger, never did we feel unsafe. And for much of the country, you know, uh, they live on under $2 a day. Um, but there was no homelessness. There was no, um, you know, like it, it was, it was a really interesting place and time to be because it, it really did challenge a lot of our, our conceptions and they had really strong, you know, familial connections and relations and societal, um, systems to set up to deal with poverty so that even if, if someone was out of work and, um, you know, didn't have a place to live, that they wouldn't starve and that they, they wouldn't sleep on the streets. And so I found that really impressive. And I also just the amazing and unbridled creativity uh, and passion of people when given that opportunity for voice to, to really step forward and, and talk to be really powerful and very inspirational. Um, every public space really turned into a space for political discussion, whether it was an alleyway with street art. Um, with a little bit going back and forth um, between different types of graffiti to different occupations that were happening to all the different like immediate forms of advertising, um, you know, for a country that also does have a lot of illiteracy. And so ways that, you know, creative ways that were created for, for reaching out to people, all the different newspapers that were started up by um, student groups and people, you know, who had maybe never been politically active before who were finally able to openly announced, you know, like from, uh, you know, from liberal parties to, to communist parties, to anarchists, to, you know, to religious groups. And ultimately, I think what was really interesting is, is their desire and effort to, you know, institute things like gender parity. They wanted to create a government, you know, after, after emerging out of an authoritarian one party system, they wanted to create a government that could, where that would never happen again. Whether or not that succeeded, um, you know, there's a lot of discussion and debate um, because, you know, obviously, um, you know, a religious 
a very powerful religious party that had been persecuted for several decades did get into power. Um, but the way that the government was structured was this attempt at this really amazing multi-party democracy where they did have gender parity enforced, you know, where, where candidates had to be alternating genders. And so that's really interesting is so that even in this little country, you know, that's, that's kind of billed as being very religious and conservative, you know, they now have a higher gender parity in their, in their, in their government than the United States does. And so I think it's always just important to take things with a grain of salt to, to critically examine and then to, to really have faith in the creativity of people. How is President Trump's, I'm trying to think of a nice way to say, attempted occupation of Cascadia, how has that affected your movement? Yeah, I would say that there's no better way to support Cascadia than to send federally armed forces to occupy it. Um, you know, it's really funny. We've had stickers for years that says, you know, U.S. out of Cascadia or that treat, you know, the United States as an occupying force. And it's always been kind of a lighthearted ha ha. And so now I think what we're really seeing and, and, you know, we saw it, you know, here in Seattle, you know, we also had the, you know, the Capitol Hill uh, occupied protest. And, uh, and then now certainly in Portland there, you know, when they sent federal forces, you know, that, that protest had been entering its, I think 50, you know, 50, it had been going on for 50 days by doing that. You, you gave a focal point to a movement that was able to revitalize it. And it really does trigger people and of all ages and all backgrounds now coming together to say, absolutely not. Uh, you know, federal forces need to leave. They're not welcome here. And that's from every different local official. And when you have every different local official saying, no, they are not welcome here, it is an occupation. It is no longer, you know, it is not at the request of the people living there. It's not at the request of the representatives of the people living there. Um, so it is an unlawful occupation from our eyes. And more than that, it's, it's, it's giving a focal point for a movement that, you know, and, and giving a, a huge revitalization and boost for a lot of people who are, are fed up and saying it's, it's not okay. Oh, Forbes, I was, Brandon and I were talking earlier um, before you came on that, you know, for the longest time, California had been kind of thought of as the quintessential progressive state. Forbes, would you agree that Cascadia has kind of taken that mantle from us and we have to step up our game? I think so. Uh, it's kind of, well, California in American politics is kind of like a punching bag, you know, for the right. You know, there's always, again, like talking about this, like that somehow California is this, like this hippy dippy, you know, out of control, uber liberal state, which is very much not true, especially when it comes to uh, inequality, when it comes to the economy. Uh, when it comes to, again, when it comes to matters of wealth, uh, California is very, very regressive. It, there might be certain, like, things you can point out that are very, quote-unquote, liberal when it comes to certain policies, when it comes to, like, you know, uh, different racial groups, gender groups, things like that. But really, again, that, that is, is such a, that's such a straw man argument. It's ridiculous. Um, California is nowhere near really what a, a Cascadia is. And it, it's very funny to me to actually even think that, you know, Donald Trump and his supporters have made such a boogeyman out of California that really it, it has no basis in reality. And actually Cascadia or, you know, again, the areas around Cascadia, that, that there really are more what they should be talking about, I guess, in a certain way, like because that actually is a progressive community. And we're definitely not a progressive community. We just have a big D next to our name, but that's about it. And uh, yeah, we have, you know, uh, people of color and women in terms of positions of power, but that's all window dressing, really. The state is very, very backwards in much other ways. Well, I think it's also important to realize, I think there's a big difference between uh, liberal and progressive. And also, I mean, but, you know, Cascadia, by by all means, I mean, has so much work to do. And I think what's nice is, I mean, when you talk about gay marriage or legalizing weed, I mean, there are aspects that, that we are ahead on, but I, I don't think that there is any progressive areas or uh, not progressive or, or, or Oregon has an income tax and no sales tax, but then maybe they have other, you know, but then they have a lot of, there's a lot of issues still of white supremacy all throughout Cascadia. Um, and there's a lot of different American, very, you know, like Idaho is its own, its own thing. Right. And so I think even while there are some of the most progressive policies in Cascadia, I also argue that we still have some of the most regressive, policies. you know, our teachers are still, incredibly woefully underpaid. But we also do have really good, you know, when Obama set up the universal healthcare system in Washington state, 
they really embraced it. And something that I've really appreciated is watching how um, our local governments have stepped up in a Cascadian fashion to fight uh, the federal government when injustice is, is being proposed. And they have done that consistently, um, whether it's on the behalf of refugees, immigrants, or even, you know, when, when Trump was just being elected, um, you know, one of the things that the Washington State Health Authority did is they got everybody together and they said, all right, what else are we going to cover? And they made things like HIV treatment fall under the category of disability so that no one would lose life-threatening access to medicine. And so there are these things and, you know, watching our, our, our state attorney um, and I know California, you know, has an Oregon, they all have very powerful, very active state attorneys that are continually suing successfully actions of the federal government. And that is honestly one of the things that makes me the most proud to live in Cascadia and, and where I do feel like we, we really all do come together in, in a way that's, that, that unites us. A lot of Cascadians, you know, they don't actually live in Cascadia. They live around the world and they live in other parts of the United States and they don't realize they're Cascadian until they leave. And then they go, oh, I get it, you know, because culturally we are distinct. And I think when, you know, when we are talking about progressive discussions, um, you know, I think when we are talking about ideas of gender, when we're talking about um, types of, of radical, direct democracy, delegative democracy, star voting, um, ranked choice voting, um, when we're talking about all of these different ideas of, of and, and there is a lot of very, you know, like radical thought happening where, well, okay, we don't like capitalism. What does that mean? What does that look like? And those discussions are happening. And I don't think that they're happening in other parts of the, of the country. I do think that they are happening along the West Coast. But I certainly think that, um, you know, when people move to the Northeast or when they move to the Southeast or you don't see those discussions and you don't see that that same type of thinking. And I do think that that is a very Cascadian and a very West Coast um, idea and discussion. And, uh, you know, what's what's fun is that, you know, we support independent sovereignty and autonomy, you know, no matter uh, where it is. And ultimately, as a pro-democracy movement, it's the people living here who gets to decide what that looks like. And so we, we talk a lot about bioregionalism because it's important to base our policy choices in bioregions and, our, and, and have that frame that bioregional framework for decision making. But ultimately, there's, there, there are several different ways that that idea could evolve, you know. And so you talked about Ecotopia. Well, so Ecotopia is Washington, Oregon, Northern California. Um, then you hear people talk about Pacifica. And so that's the West Coast. That's your West Coast block of California, Oregon, Washington together. And then Cascadia being the bioregion that, that then incorporates British Columbia. And so I think, you know, the important thing is, is really, um, you know, to, to continue to inspire uh, people's imagination for what's possible and don't get bogged down in, in letting our reality be defined by people who do not have our best interests, uh, you know, at heart. And uh, let's define our own reality. Let's, let's define our own future that we get to build together in a positive way by the people living here who have the most invested in that. And uh, as long as we can continue to inspire the imagination, whether or not, you know, independence happens this year or next year, we will continue to be working together to make our world a better place. And we don't need people in Washington, D.C. or Ottawa um, to tell us how to do that. You know, that's something that we can be doing every day. One, you said something that it really made some sense to me. I'm a lifelong, I was a New Englander born and raised. And it's not only is it environment, but there is a different way of politics. Even though you could consider New England to be a blue area, it's not as progressive as the West Coast, but I will say the Republicans are much more centrist in New England compared to West Coast Republicans. Like it's very hard in New England to find a lot of pro lifers or people who are anti-gay marriage. Right now it's, the Republicans have a very like old school libertarian streak to them in comparison. But what I wanted to hit about, hit, talk about, both of the California independence movement and the Cascadia movement clearly has roots in, in the environment and protecting the environment more than the federal government wants to. How much do you think that has to do with the fact that, you know, we were discovered later by your, like by Europe and that, I would say maybe our city designs or our population densities are just a lot different than those on the East Coast or in the Midwest. Yeah, I mean, so I think, um, you know, so I call this, uh, we've seen a tree. 
And uh, I, I say that because people in the Northwest or California or the Cascadia bioregion traditionally have probably seen a tree, an actual old growth tree grown to its full extent um, that is hundreds of years old. And, you know, only in, in the continuous in the United States, 2% uh, of old growth forests still remain, almost exclusively uh, in the Western United States, almost exclusively in California and, and the Cascadia bioregion. And I feel like when you've seen a tree, you know what is at risk and you know what we are losing when those trees are cut down. And so, you know, when people are talking about climate change, when people are talking about logging, it's not just an abstract notion. And we talk a lot about how culture defines place. Well, that also goes for um, cities and our urban and built environments. And so when you live and you go to Boston, I mean, I've been to Boston and Rhode Island and uh, these other areas, and, and a lot of these cities, you will not see one old growth tree, or there might be a few in a, in a, in a yard somewhere that was preserved. And, then, and how that defines our culture and what we think of as even, as even home. You know, for some people, home is apartments. And, uh, you know, and, and they, you know, it could be condos or apartments, and they travel to office buildings in apartments and tower buildings and uh, you know, they get into a car and they do that and they use Google Maps. And I think that it talks about, you know, how even just our experience of, of where we live and how we live is a political environment. And it, it informs us and it informs how we, we view our world and how we relate to our world. What, what I love about bioregionalism is it just gets into this, you know, into everything down to how our maps, you know, like how our maps are created. Ma like maps are political tools. They are how we relate to our broader world. And no map is created without a political or economic agenda behind it. So when a map is created by a nation state, it uses roads and cities and economic markers for, for the things that you care about. And when Google Maps creates Google Maps and an app that you use every day, when it says take a left at the Burger King, um, you know, it's doing that because of a paid advertiser to advance its own economic interest. And so what I love about bioregionalism is it, is, is it fakes it till it makes it and it, it brings it back and it creates new maps and new territories where we relate to our world in a different way. And we relate to our world through our environment, both culturally and economically, but especially through our watersheds and our fiber sheds and our food sheds. And it says, this is how we should be orienting ourselves and this is how we should be structuring our society. And uh, I think that there's something very subversive in that. And I, I really enjoy, um, you know, playing around with those lines of, of what's official, what's not official, and, and how do we see and relate to the world and people around us. It, it sounds like what you're talking about is that uh, really, again, like, you know, we're under this kind of like mental, psychological grip about certain things. And that part of the Cascadian movement, and I guess in a lesser extent, the California movement is that we have to kind of unlearn these things that we've learned that we have to move beyond the, the idea of, you know, the, the United States is always united, right? Uh, Canada is always going to be Canada. Uh, certain lines are already drawn in the sand. That's just the way it is, done and done. You're talking about that we have to really, again, uh, for lack of a better term, kind of like turn off the programming that we already have in our heads. And that's probably one of the biggest obstacles, basically, correct? Yeah, I think that's really well said. I think that, you know, the, the biggest thing, you know, if we really want to, get away from these frameworks that are, you know, like the national, you know, like that are really harmful to our communities is we have to stop working within them and we have to stop propagating them and we have to stop sharing them. And uh, one of the best ways to do that is to find healthy frameworks and healthy systems and start using those. And a lot of times we have to create them because I think that, you know, the United States and colonial governments and the Canadian government have spent hundreds of years erasing those and making sure that you have a dependency um, and, a, and a framework which you learn for eight hours a day in schools that is the way that you relate to the world. And it is the only way that you relate to the world. Cascadia being a cross-border region is a really interesting example because the reason, you know, the reason why we create so many resources is because they don't exist. Um, you know, we create maps uh, of, of areas that, that uh, include, you know, um, forest types. Okay, well, if you're in, you live in the United States and you try to create that map, it will stop at the Washington border. If you're in British Columbia, it will stop at the British Columbian border. And so, um, you know, that, and that goes for so many different things, whether it's, what, what's the GDP of Cascadia? 
What's the GDP of uh, you know BC, Washington, Oregon? Um, what's the what's the GDP of the Cascadia bioregion? And if you can't answer that, um, then you know it's not a real thing. But the minute that you can define it and and give an answer, it becomes real. And so and not only that, but it becomes a more efficient way of operating. And so here in Cascadia, there is no collective map that has been distributed that has like the indigenous first nations of both south of the border and north of the border. Um, you know, here in Seattle, we used to, you know, we lived on the Puget Sound and, and up in BC, it was the, the, the Prince Georgia, you know, straight, one, one name south of the border, one name north of the border. Well, the fact that they're a part of the same body didn't account. And so now in 2012, you know, they renamed it the Salish Sea. It's the Salish Sea eco region. That's a part of the Cascadia bioregion because it better represents the place and the people who have always lived here. And I think that as we move forward, it makes a lot of sense. And so you have, now you have all of our, our, our governors and local governments and corporations working together and working to break down those borders because they literally inhibit our, regional, our region's ability to respond to earthquakes, to respond to forest fires, to talk about pollution and, 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 and uh, how we cooperate with that. And so because of that, we have this innovation happening that is actually more efficient than a national framework. And you see it in, uh, you know, Jay Inslee and uh, I think the BC Premier are working on the Cascadia Innovation Corridor. Uh, you have uh, Kate Brown, the Oregon, you know, the governor of Oregon working with uh, BC and Washington on high-speed rail to run from Eugene, Oregon through Portland, through Seattle, uh, up to Vancouver, BC. You have uh, Microsoft working with, um, you know, to, to increase um, plane service. And so you have a Cascadia Air Service, which is going to have the first electric planes, uh, you know, for, for short distance travel, taking off and being a commuter flight between Vancouver and Seattle. Um, you have fiber optics being built. You have all of these different ways in which we are finding that it's more effective to work here together than it is to work through a bureaucratic, cumbersome, and increasingly non-representative uh, system uh, that's thousands of miles away on the East Coast. Forbes, I know that we're equals and co-hosts, but I'm making an executive decision. Brandon, we were talking about, you know, bef you know, before the virus really hit, we wanted to take this on the road and do a, a road show going all through California. Forbes, making the executive decision, we're going to Oregon and we're going to Washington as well, because I am this interview has been so uplifting and exciting. Like I just got to get back to visit the Pacific Northwest. So you know what, uh, Bill? I just you know th this is just typical of your just little mini dictatorship you have here. But you know what, broken clocks and all that. I think you're right. Oh <laughs> yeah, it's I first we'll have to go to Powell's Bookstore in Oregon. Um, I'll spend a half a day there looking for chess books, and then I'll, I'll have to take the wife and kids. Um, Northwest Trek was one of my favorite places I've ever been. And um, my wife insists there's apparently a, a caboose hotel where it's all cabooses in Washington State. And she's like, we're staying there. Um, so it's happening. Full disclosure, by the way, I've actually never been to Oregon. So actually, th this would be quite exciting for me. I actually have not been north of uh, uh, San Francisco. Well, actually, I guess north of like Napa. Um, that's the furthest I've gone in California. I, I grew up uh, in Chicago. So I still have moved out to uh, uh, Seal Beach, California, which is in SoCal. Uh, but yeah, never got up that way. So it would actually be very exciting. So, you know, Bill, I mean, again, you're, you're, you're being very domineering as usual. And uh, again, I'm uncomfortable, but I, I think I'll go with it. And I'll tell you, Forbes, like from Humboldt County to Washington State, um, someone once described the beauty as overwhelming. And that is a, um, that's a very accurate description. So Brandon, thank you so much. Keep being the leader, um, and we're going to keep stealing ideas from you. I think um, next sporting event I can go to, I'll have a California flag. I love that part of your movement. And, uh, yeah, thank you for your time on a Friday night. Yeah, absolutely. This has been quite enlightening and uh, quite an education. Thanks again. Really appreciate it. Well, it's absolutely my pleasure. And what's really exciting is, so if you've never even been north of, of San Francisco, then you haven't seen the Redwoods. So, you know, Mount Shasta, Redwoods. Uh, Crater Lake up in Oregon and I mean it, that's a there's a, a lot of wonderful road trips to be had and I think you might understand the Cascadian identity and, and sentiment even more uh, after you take that trip so actually it would be very exciting for me because like oh. you know I've heard so many good things 
Bill has talked it up before, actually. So again, like, no, I would totally, I'd be down for that. That'd be a, that'd be a hell of a thing, actually. That'd be great. Yeah, when you think you care about the environment now, wait until you go to the Pacific Northwest. It will be like, uh, you'll be like Charlie Bucket going to the chocolate factory. And I, I'd, I'd even say go so far as uh, make sure to get up to, uh, you know, bring a passport if you have one and, and jump on a clipper from Seattle and you can take a day trip up to Victoria. Uh, you can take some of the ferries out to the San Juan Islands or the Gulf Islands or up to Vancouver, BC, just to kind of complete your journey. Um, there's some beautiful mountains and stuff. But I'd also like to just also end on saying, you know, what I what I love about the Cascadia movement, and I think the California movement is similar, is that it really is a grassroots movement. And so, um, the, you know, we always talk about it being a movement of leaders. And, uh, you know, rather than a leaderless uh, revolution or a leaderless movement, uh, you know, we talk about devolution as opposed to revolution and then a movement of leaders that can empower every person to be active and engaged. And I think that's actually my favorite part about Cascadia and the Cascadia movement is, is, is honestly seeing people who are much smarter than I am, seeing the creativity um, that people bring to it and uh, just the ideas that people have for approaching situations that I would have never dreamed of in my life. And, uh, and being able to encourage those and say, hey, you have a place here in this movement and, uh, and watching the things that grow from that is, is truly inspirational. So uh, it's always a joy. And uh, yeah, thank you again for having me today. Oh, we'll have you on again soon. I, I have a feeling that uh, if you're willing, you will become a reoccurring guest. This was a lot of fun and thank you once again. Yeah, really. Yeah. Well, and let's, uh, let's all look towards November and, and just see how things continue to play out. And I hope that uh, everything stays safe in Oakland and, and in other uh, places. Well, there you have it. Another episode of the Free the Bear podcast. Thank you very much for listening. If you can, give it a thumbs up. Even if you didn't like it, give it that good old thumbs up and subscribe. I'm very old, but I've been told there is a bell that you're supposed to push or ding or something. So do that. For more information about the California National Party, go to californianational.party or on Twitter, vote underscore CNP. And in conclusion, Free the bear. Grr.